Well, good morning, church. I hope you're all uh, settled in. You've had communion. You've uh, been eating the Easter eggs that the Easter bunny dropped off at your houses. Uh, maybe you caught a glimpse of him or her yesterday. Um, I hope you're all flourishing in this new world that we find ourselves in and let me start by wishing you a very happy Easter. My hope and prayer is that this year, perhaps more than any that you've experienced before, you find your faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ sustaining you and giving you hope and assuring you for the days ahead. Can I also say how um, blessed I am to be part of this church. I love being part of CBBC and in the midst of what I know for many of you is quite uncertain times, I hope that you're all doing well. Um, the older generation, I want to say, I know are doing well. They're learning new technology. Uh, even David Dawes had a Zoom meeting with Julie this week and uh, his plan is that he's going to get his uh, uh, Bible study group together and they're all going to Zoom and have uh, um, uh, do Bible study by by a Zoom meeting. Hope that works out. I know that the families are getting to grips with Marco Polo and you're leave, leaving little messages um, for each other uh, all over the place, which is good. And uh, the kids are also using technology. That doesn't surprise me so much. They're even better than most of us. Uh, some of you may have seen little Sammy's uh, um, uh, Bible study for us. So it was great. Well done, Sammy. I really appreciated your insight this week. It was really good. And um, the oversight team too, we've been keeping up with the technology and we've been meeting online and uh, we've kind of like worked out that decisions can be made without the need for hours of conversation. Mm, I wonder if we're going to go back to meeting in person when this is all over. We'll see. Anyway, on to the message. I get the good one. Easter Sunday, the crescendo of our faith, full of hope, full of joy. And I will get to that, I promise. Uh, but just before I do, I do want to set the scene a little by picking up where Pamela left off yesterday. I've really enjoyed all the contributors this week. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Ben Gardner. Thank you, Ben Morton. Thank you, George. Thank you, John Delaney. Thank you, Julie, for all of your input. I think I've got everybody uh, there, but thank you. If you haven't seen all of those, you can go back and click on the videos on the YouTube channel and you can go through. There's all kinds of things on that. There's uh, um, those messages, but uh, there's the messages over the past couple of Sundays. And there's also, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's also little updates on uh, the building and where we're going and uh, all that kind of stuff. So hope we, hopefully we're not overloading you, but there is some information uh, there. So I want to uh, carry on from where Pamela left off uh, yesterday. You see, before they knew any different, the followers of Jesus were in a dark place. They, The events of the previous few days for them had happened so quickly. One minute they were arguing over who of them was going to be the greatest in the coming kingdom, and the next, they were denying that they even knew the person that they had been following. They were in fear of their lives. And they watched all their hopes and all their dreams die on a cross, along with the person, the one, Jesus, who they thought was their saviour and was their messiah. Now, I don't want to link everything that we're going to look at this morning to the coronavirus. But I certainly know that many people had everything mapped out. They knew where they were headed. But suddenly something has come along that has thrown it all up in the air. There's fear, there's uncertainty, and with some there's complete devastation has already happened and there's a fear of it still to come. You'll see in a minute when we read the passage of scripture that this is how the followers of Jesus were. There were tears, there was fear, there was disbelief, there was doubt. They were even experiencing lockdown due to the fear that the religious leaders were going to come and kill them. My point is that it is in this place that they found themselves. And perhaps for some of us, this is also where we find ourselves this Easter. So I'm going to read from the message version this morning, the whole of John 20. Now, you may want to shut your eyes and listen. and Don't worry, uh, I can't see you if you do fall asleep. Uh, so uh, you can you can listen to what I have uh, to, to the reading this morning. And it says this, it says, Early in the morning 
on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, breathlessly panting. They took the master from the tomb. We don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple left immediately for the tomb. They ran neck and neck. The other disciple got to the tomb first, outrunning Peter. Stooping to look in, he saw the pieces of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived after him, entering the tomb, observed the linen clothes lying there, and the kerchief used to cover his head, not lying with the linen cloths, that, uh, but separate, neatly folded by itself. Then the other disciple, the one who had gotten there first, went to the tomb, took one look at the evidence, and believed. No one yet knew from the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The disciples then went back home. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she knelt to look into the tomb and saw two angels sitting there, dressed in white, one at the head, the other at the foot of where Jesus' body had been laid. They said to her, Woman, why do you weep? They took my master, she said, and I don't know where they put him. After she said this, she turned away and she saw Jesus standing there but she didn't recognise him. Jesus spoke to her, Woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, Mister, if you took him, tell me where you put him so that I can care for him. Jesus said, Mary. Turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabbani, meaning teacher. Jesus said, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers and tell them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went, telling the news to the disciples. I saw the Master. And she told them everything he said to her. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews, had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them and said, Peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were exuberant. Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we saw the master. But he said, Unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, the disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them and said, Peace to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, My master, my God. Jesus said, So you believe because you've seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs and are written down in this book. These are written down so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. I love John's account. 
I can really identify with the different characters. I mean, you know, none of us like to be Thomas, but, uh, you know, I think a few of us possibly uh, would be in that place if that had happened to us, that we hadn't been there and they had all said that they saw this person who had raised from the dead. Um, but uh, maybe you feel m more like Mary just crying and weeping um, because he was gone. Or the disciples hiding fearful of your life because of uh, the Pharisees wanting to kill you. I don't know. I, for me, it conjures up all kinds of images, but John particularly in writing, this is another reason why I find it my favourite, and I love the image that John paints of Mary looking in and seeing where Jesus' body had been laid with the angel sitting at either end. The early listeners to this story, the very first listeners, would have immediately pictured another story in the Bible, which was the mercy seat. In the Old Testament, the, it was um, in the temple, the Holy of Holies. It was the Ark of the Covenant, and it was where, uh, between the two angels, was where the blood of a bull was sacrificed for the sin of the people, which God had atoned for. And uh, as I say, this seat had cherubim at each, uh, at each end of the seat. And it's very symbolic of what Jesus had done, the mercy seat, the place of mercy where his blood had been shed for the atonement of all sins, not just for the people of Israel, but for all people. Um, but anyway, I'm not going to talk about that, although I just did. Um, I'm going to tell you about uh, a couple of little points I just want to bring out. And uh, the first I want to talk about is Mary's experience. I already mentioned where she looks inside the tomb, where she was expecting to find Jesus' body. The remnants of all her hopes and dreams, she was expecting to be in there because that's where Jesus was and that was where her dreams lay with him. Instead, she had a conversation with angels it's kind of like all matter of fact, the way that John wrote it. But actually, the part I want to get to is the very next conversation. It says she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. And Jesus spoke to her saying, woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? Like he didn't know. She, thinking he was the gardener, said, mister, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I can care for him. But Jesus said, Mary. She knew at that point, turning to face him, she said, teacher, Rabbanai. So she turned around and she saw who she thought was a gardener. She didn't recognise that it was, in fact, Jesus. Now, don't you find that a little surprising? Why didn't she recognise him? She knew Jesus. She'd been with him for years. Do you think God had blinded her to the fact it was Jesus? Had her eyes been covered in some way? Was Jesus so disfigured um, that she couldn't recognise him? Was she just in so much distress with tears down her eyes that she couldn't see that it was him? I don't believe that was the case because we read elsewhere of people not recognising Jesus in the form that he took after the resurrection. And think of the followers on the road to Emmaus and also the disciples in other accounts uh, uh, as well. Now, you see, I believe that Jesus was in his resurrection body that was so unlike his earthly one that it was unrecognisable until he spoke her name. Something familiar that he knew about her just the way he spoke her name. But it made me think and... I think it's quite a deep thought. It's, do I always, myself, recognise when I see Jesus? Do I miss, dismiss him when he doesn't reveal himself to me in the way that I'm used to seeing him? Am I blinded to him because of my expectations and presumptions about him? Is it my disappointment that blinds me to him? Can I see him now, right now, in all the things that I'm going through? Do I recognise where he is in this place? 
The next thing I want to look at is when Jesus appeared to the disciples. This is when they were afraid of what was outside and they were in lockdown. Jesus appeared to them, is what we read, and again had to show them his wounds so that they would believe it was him. That's what he spent his time doing, proving it was him. And he looks at them and the first thing he says to them is, Peace, guys. Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. Now think about this. If you were the disciples, wouldn't you have just wanted to hang out and catch up with Jesus and find out all that had been going on the past few days and you know, make sense of what they had uh, experienced, the death, the resurrection, the, the beating, the whipping, the, um, the things that Jesus had said? Wouldn't you have wanted him to talk about that? But he didn't. He said, just as the Father has sent me, I send you. The cross is a symbol of our faith. Christ crucified. But the danger is, and the battle that many Christians face, I believe, is a desire to stay there. To stay in the security that the cross brings. That place of mercy, of grace, of healing, of forgiveness. But that is not his desire for us to stay there. Yes, we need to come to that place. But when we get there, the words that he speaks to us are the same as the words he spoke to those first disciples and first followers in that room. It's, I am here because the Father has sent me. Now I'm sending you. I'm here in this place of mercy. I brought your forgiveness, I brought your healing, your restoration, but I brought it so you can tell others the good news that I'm here for them. It's not his desire for anybody not to get the invite. Our job is to help others find that place of security. Let others know that they're invited and accepted into the greatest banquet and party that the universe has ever known. They are welcome, welcome to come, whoever they are, wherever they're at in their faith journey, even if they haven't even started it. They're welcome to come and eat with him at that banquet and eat with us. Of course, what he did, dying on the cross, impacts us. It must. But his immediate expectation is and was that his followers will take the good news to the world around them. Doesn't our world need that good news? Perhaps now, more than ever, maybe for the first time in a generation, there are some that will hear this at this time. The final point I want to bring out is the way that Jesus managed to, in the midst of all of this, relate with each person. Thomas wasn't at the event I, I just mentioned and didn't believe, but Jesus came and found him anyway. He didn't have to, but he did. And he used the very, very words and got Thomas to do the very things that Thomas said he would, um, that he needed in order to believe. And Jesus did those things for him. How incredible is that, that Jesus came and met Thomas exactly where he wanted, in that place of doubting that he was real, that he had, was who he said he was, that he'd done what he had um, said he was going to do. And he found and sought out Thomas for that. He met each person exactly where they were at. Our God not only died for the sins of the world, but he's a relational God who will come and meet you where you are at, warts and all. Earlier this week, my son Ben spoke on lament, and uh, many of you will have heard that message. And he's talked about the way that we can approach our God in and with our pain, our hurts, our broken hearts, our fears, our losses, our despair. He is a God who may have 
billions of people on this planet right now. But he cares for each one of them. He cares about you, where you are right now, how you're feeling, whether you're coping, whether you're not. Tell him. Yes, he knows, but he also wants to hear it from you as well. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this morning that we would recognise where you are. Lord, even though you may not be appearing to us the way that we expect, even though you may look different, the way that you are acting may be different. Lord, I pray in the midst of that, we would hear your voice in the way that you want to speak to us. Lord, help us to recognise you, recognise your voice, recognise where you're at. Help us to love the cross, Lord. And what it means, all its symbolism, but help us not to stay there. Lord, help us to be so joyful at the place of the cross, that place of redemption and healing, that we want to bring others there. Lord, in this darkness at this time that we find ourselves, Lord, I pray that you would help us to bring light into a world that's despairing. Lord, help us to learn how to take the good news into that um, place. And Lord, I just want to thank you also for being a personable God. Lord, I want to thank you that you care about each one of us with the individual and not just the mass you are interested in each one of us. Lord, I pray this Easter that more than ever, Lord, in our isolation, in our separation, in our confusion, in our despair, in our anxiety, in our fear, in our wondering. Lord, I pray that you would meet us. Lord, help us to see you and help us to be a joyful people. Lord, help us to live out what you have put into us, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. The song I want you to listen to this morning is one that you do know we do sing at church. And it's actually a bit of a response to this. And it's called 10,000 Reasons. And it's actually a response to all that we've heard this week. It's saying because of Jesus, because of what we see, because of what we've seen, because of what he's done, so will I. I will do it because our God came and he lived as a human being. He lived in a way that we can follow and that we can see. And he lived so that we can live and tell others. So will I. I hope that you have a really great Easter and I hope that I haven't blinded you with my shirt this morning. Thanks Neville and Sandy for that. Blessings to you. Happy Easter.